So if your goal is to be a top performer, that means that what you do is determined by the crappiness of the other performers. All right. So why am I unable to be content with anything? As the title suggests, I've recently come to the realization that I have a habit of ruining good things in my life because I become discontent with them. For years, I've worked in commission sales environments and have actually left the same job multiple times for no real reason. I have a job where I can easily be a top performer and make over 100k a year with minimal effort. However, I always fall into the same mindset of beginning to hate the job for no real reason, and I do things in the job that get me in trouble on purpose to bait them into firing me. What is wrong with me? I do not work excessive hours at the job, and it is beyond easy for my skill set, and I'm still unhappy with it. This has, been, this has happened at multiple other jobs I've had as well. I will become very good at whatever job it may be, lose interest, and then self-sabotage my way out of it. This sort of behavior follows outside of work too. Hobbies, for example, result in the same way. Whether it is guitar, a specific video game, video editing, every interest I've ever had results in me becoming good at something quickly, then sabotaging my way out of it. I once got into powerlifting obsessively. It was all I ate, slept, and breathed for multiple years. I became the strongest guy in the gym without even being the biggest. Then one day it just snapped and I stopped going and caring altogether, ruining my health in the process. Even in video games, I follow the same trend. I'm League of Legends. In, in League of Legends, for example, I will one trick a single champion until I get to diamond, and then I will completely lose interest and start inting games down to gold or plat because I lost the passion to get better. I am now 26 years old, and I feel as though I've come to a point where I have nothing to show for myself in life because I cannot keep a passion for anything. I'm, in addition, I have no desire to work, play video games, or exist anymore. I'm not suicidal and do not have suicidal thoughts, but I also do not particularly enjoy life. Apologies if this is long-winded, but TLDR, I've ne never been able to be content with anything, and I have pretty much... Nothing for me to look forward to in life anymore, which makes me feel like I'm just treading water for the sake of treading water. So, this is a case that is very important. This is a very important post. And here's the reason why this post is very important. So what I want to talk to you all about today is what I would call the, I don't know if this is the right word, but almost like the in-between people, okay? So this is a case of someone who is able to grind really hard, right? So like, and get, become successful in something and then ends up like abandoning it or sabotaging it. So the first thing to understand is that in our community, we tend to have two groups of people, or we tend to talk about two groups of people. One is the, I'm going nowhere in life. This is your, you know, your neat person, your hikikomori Nini person, like I'm 24, I play video games all day, like, ah, like, how do I get a job? How do I find love? Like, how do I socialize? Like, so we have this perception in our community that like, there's a lot of people who are like this. At the opposite end of the spectrum, we have like someone else in our community who's sort of the high performer, right? So this is someone that we saw in our high performance group, high potential group. These are like engineers, like software programmers, like other successful people, like sometimes investment bankers and other randos in our community. Professional poker players, like crypto savants, like all kinds of other people in our community who are like successful. But the truth is that halfway between those two things is what I'd call like the halfway successful person. And this person is, is like not able to, I'd say like build a dynasty. So they're not able to, let me kind of put it this way. Okay. So at, at one side we have the neat, right? Not in, no employment, education, training. And then over here we have the, what I would call the dynasty builder. And what do I mean by dynasty? So this is a case of someone who has a success, has a success, has a success, and they build on top of it. So over time, like they're able to like build a life, right? Like I have a successful career, check. I have a successful relationship, check. I'm going to, you know, I, I do, I enjoy, I have like good family relationships, check. 
Now I need to figure out entertainment. Yes. And then up here is like dharma. I need meaning. So these are our successful people over here. The truth is that the majority of our community is actually somewhere around here. And these are what I'd call the half performers. So they're not like incapable of getting jobs. They're not incapable of forming relationships, but they're not able to build on their successes. And why is that, right? What's going on with these people? So let's kind of go back to this and take a look. So what do you guys think motivates this per person, right? So what do y'all see? So it's not self-sabotage. So self-sabotage, they're motivated towards self-sabotage, but what motivates this person? What do you guys think? Okay, this is really interesting, right? So now people are saying progress. They're saying improvement. They're saying the grind. They're saying validation. Very good, right? So let, let's take a look at this post. What do we see here? Top performer, right? Um, let's look at this. I've become very good. Okay. Uh, and then let's like, every interest I've had becomes becoming good at something quickly. Quickly skill up. So now what we're going to do is I'm going to move this thing over here. So I've been taking some notes. So we can see that what motivates this person is a sense of progress, improvement, grind, validation, wanting to be at the top, diamond. So the other thing that I want you guys to notice is that many of this person's, like their language all involves comparison. So they use words like diamond. They use words like top. They'll use words like become the best, become better. So fundamentally, there's a lot of comparison going on. This will be like, this will become important in a second. But if we kind of think about it, so this person's saying like, I don't understand, like I'm not motivated, I sabotage things, incorrect. You have to understand that you're not not motivated, you're motivated by a particular thing. And what is this person motivated by? Progress and improvement. So this is kind of interesting because people will say like, people will assume, for example, like the neats, for example, will be like, I can't get motivated to do anything. So I, I, sh I wish I was progress oriented. I wish I was growth oriented. I wish I could grind, right? People value or envy these qualities. They wish they could, wanted to become very skilled. Like think about how awesome this is. Like for the neat, they're like, oh my God, this person can quickly skill up. We had a question earlier about someone being stuck at 1K MMR. And here's this person who's like get able to get to the top and then they self-sabotage and whatever. So it's kind of interesting because actually what this person is motivated by is what the needs crave. Okay. So then the question is like, what's going on here? Why do they abandon things if they're motivated towards growth? So let's, I'm going to draw you guys a curve. Okay. So if this axis is effort and this axis is progress, what does this curve look like? Can y'all tell? What do you guys think? Beginning is the easiest. Very good. Exponential. Yes. And there's an asymptote here. Right? So this is the problem. So what do you guys think this person does? So you may look at this person. You may say like, oh, they're interested in games. They learn instruments. They find jobs. And they look at all these different things and they're like, I can do anything for like one year. Bodybuilding. So what's going on here? What's going on is they're on this curve, right? So like, let's, this is the bodybuilding. So they start here. I get to the strongest person in the gym and then there's a gap, right? So they hit the exponential phase of the curve. And so now what happens is the more effort they put in, the less gain they get. Because this is what's rewarding. Everyone wants progress, right? So now what they end up doing is they're like, oh, at this point, their brain is making a calculation that at this point, now I'm in the red zone, which means that I have to put in a bunch of effort to get a very little yield. So then what their brain does is, oh, let's like switch. Let's start playing lol. Oh, here we go. Oh, that's some good shit. Oh, Ooh, look at all like, look at, cause I'm kind of a Chad and I can like focus and I can be motivated and look at how much 
effort I have to expend. I have to expend very little effort to make a lot of progress. And as soon as they get good at something, they decide to abandon it. So this is the problem of like a, a lack of a, of a dynasty builder, right? Because at some point what their brain just tells them is, hey, instead of investing, like, because notice they just get to diamond, right? They're not getting to challenger, right? They say they're the top performer. They're making 100K a year. They're not making a million. So they're never actually becoming the best at something. They're just getting like decently good. They work until they hit somewhere along this point in the curve. And then their mind is like, oh, it'll be easier if we just switch gears to something else because then we can get that sweet, sweet progressium. Addicted to the grind, absolutely. And so they get stuck in this place. Right? You guys see that? And so this is why this person hops. And so if you want to understand the self-sabotage, it's like self-sabotage is an easy way to quit. You guys get that? Because if they quit, what ends up happening is they'll feel bad. They'll be like, oh, I'm a quitter. But hey, chat, this is progressium. I'm not a quitter. So what I'm going to do is going to get fired. And then I have a reason. I have an excuse to, okay, like I just got fired from my job. Let me be positive. Let me be growth oriented. Okay, I'm going to start bodybuilding. And you see, I'm not like those other losers that just like sits around and like, wah, wah, like, oh my God. No, I'm going to like do something with my life. And so then they, they pick the next thing. And then... Then what happens is like they get kind of, they don't get bored with it. What happens is they get to this phase of the, the curve where effort does not yield a lot of gain. And so they switch to something else. So now the question is, okay, what do we do about this? And this is the key thing. It's about comparison. Okay. So if you want to understand how to break out of this, so the first thing you've got to do is first of all, have an awareness of this curve and start to ask yourself questions like, you know, why am I self-sabotaging? Is this the point at which I feel like effort does not equal reward, right? Is this the phase that I'm getting at? Is this what determines what triggers the self-sabotage? Because what I'm noticing in this person is that like you guys get that what's motivating this person is not a love for any of these things. They're not get actually getting motivated by like wanting to play league. They're not getting motivated about wanting to be healthy. They're not getting motivated for the love of the thing at all. All they're getting motivated for is this. Let's see. Becoming good at something. Okay. I became the strongest guy. So it's about comparison. It's about rising above people. And then I stopped caring and going at all. You know, all a single trick champion, I get to j diamond. It's, so it's all about achievement, comparison, and like ranking against other people. So this is a problem of ego. Okay. So there are a couple of things you can do here. So the first is, you know, ask yourself what motivates you. So really, as you are doing any one of these activities, start to ask yourself, you know, like, what is it that, what do I enjoy about this? Why is this no longer fun for me? And, and it's not just looking here because what the person is looking at is they're focusing on this phase, right? This is another problem in terms of how to learn. What we always look at in humans is the area that we make mistakes. Because this is broken. But if we really want to understand ourselves, we have to look at this part too. So, you know, when are things going good? Right? So you need to examine that. Like, what motivates me right now? Like, why do I want to be the best power lifter in the gym? Like, what appeals to me about this? It's not just about the quitting. It's about the po positive motivation as, as well. So you can ask questions like, what feels good about it? Okay. And so you can start to do internal exploration. You can do this with a coach, with a therapist as well. All right. So I'd say the Atman Pada, if, if this is a problem that y'all struggle with, check out the Atman Pada. So the Atman Pada is the path of self in um, Dr. K's guide to meditation. Also for the people for the last one, if you feel like you've fallen behind, there's, uh, there's a video and there's some stuff in the depression guide about like this concept of falling behind and how to get past that. So you can do these kinds of things. And then the other thing that I'm going to teach you is 
a, a meditation. So the other thing is that comparison is about ego, right? So the other thing is that this person wants to be better than other people. So as long as like you being better than other people is your primary driver, what you do is going to be fundamentally controlled by other people. Do y'all understand this? So we're going to switch gears for a second and kind of like talk about ego for a second. So if your goal is to be a top performer, that means that what you do is determined by the crappiness of the other performers. It has nothing to do with like objective skill in a thing. It's just wanting to be the best. So if, I, if I'm motivated by being the best and I'm in a math class with six-year-olds, I'm not going to learn much math, right? If I want to be the strongest in a class and I'm in a class with six-year-olds, it's not going to motivate me at all to like work, right? Like I'm not going to work out. I don't need to work out. I'm fighting against six-year-olds. I'm racing against six-year-olds. I'm playing basketball against six-year-olds. Like, so this concept of like ego and wanting to be the best fundamentally causes you to lose control over your life. It's a huge problem because then your perception of like you being the best is ultimately what motivates you. That means it's not internal motivation. It's external motivation. Okay. So then the question is like, how do we get rid of this ego? So the ego is also comparative, things like that. There's stuff in the, uh, in the meditation guide about a hum God and Vedic psychology. You guys should definitely watch that if this is interesting to you. So what do you do about this? So this is where I'm going to teach you guys about Shunya. So Shunya is null, void, or zero. And this is kind of weird. So Shunya was discovered in, in India. So people will, historians will sort of credit India with the discovery of zero. But the interesting thing is that zero was not discovered by like mathematicians in India. It was discovered by yogis. So what happened is like yogis like will meditate for a while and they discovered like the concept of nullness, void, or zero, like the absence of things. And what they, the way that they essentially discovered the concept of absence of things is through explorations of their identity. What yogis essentially did is they like sat down and they tried to figure out who am I? So they noticed, okay, there's this thing called the ego, which likes to compare. So like some of my identity is based on comparison to other people. I'm tall, I'm short. So when people identify with qualities like tall and short, do you guys get that? Like you can't be tall or short unless other people existed. The whole word tall or the whole word short has within its concept a comparison to something else. You guys get that? So in that way, all of the qualities that we use to describe ourselves are fundamentally comparative. So even concepts like gender, so male or female, like male doesn't mean anything if there is not a female. Female doesn't mean anything if there isn't a male. Finger doesn't mean anything unless there's a toe. Toe doesn't mean anything unless there's a finger. So all of these concepts are comparative by nature. So what the yogis essentially discovered through meditation is that there is a sense of nullness or void, and that this is like a primary quality of existence. And this is where like the meditation stuff gets kind of weird. So if people want to understand like, what is Om? People will say like, people will say it's it's the fundamental sound of the universe or the fundamental vibration of the universe like what on earth does that mean and this is where things get like kind of really off the rails is when you do shunya meditation you will see shunya in things it's kind of hard to describe but like i would say you know there are these big level concepts which are like so let me give, just give you guys an example so one is like energy so energy is like a high level concept. Like you can see energy in different places. You, there's like gravitational potential energy. There is electrical energy. There is like magnetic energy. Like energy is like a big thing, right? It's like a high level concept. And so in that way, shunya is another like high level concept. Energy and null are like two very different things. They're not like in the same ballpark at all. So what the yogis essentially figured out is that there's like a set of like basic qualities in the universe. So one is like the energy principle. One is this concept of null or shunya. One is, um, what's another example of like, oh, another one is duality. So duality is like another example of like 
a broad level thing that can't be compared to energy, but it's just the fact that like two things exist and that duality is essentially false. So tall and short is another good example, right? So like you, you as human beings, we can group the world into like division, like we can divide things. So we can say that something is tall, something is short, something is red, something is green. This person has black hair. This person is old, young. So our mind divides the world into duality. So duality is like sort of a fundamental quality, not really of the world, but that's a little bit complicated. But do you guys get how like shunya, um, energy and duality are like three different buckets that don't really relate to each other? So what the yogis essentially did is discovered these like fundamental different buckets and there's a limited number of them. So what are all the buckets? These, all of these buckets became the mantras that they said. So there's like one mantra for energy. There's one mantra for duality. There's one mantra for shunya. These are like fundamental qualities of existence. And then under the common element that binds all of these things together is om. And how do you understand that? It's like you do the shunya meditation, you do the energy meditation, you do the duality meditation, and then you actually discover, oh, there's like existence threads between all three of these things, right? So like there is some amount of existence in all three of these things. So even if it's duality, even if it's shunya, even if it's like energy, there's like something exists. And so that's when people said, oh, that quality of existence is something that we're going to call om. So that's when people say like Om is the fundamental like vibration of existence. What that literally means is like it's the quality of that which exists. So if someone's saying, I'm so confused, I apologize. I told you we'd go off the rails. So these are things that if you really want to understand, it's not like a logical understanding. It's a like subjective experience that you'll understand. So I'm going to teach you guys a Shunya meditation. So if you really want to understand this stuff, you have to do this meditation and then you will start to experience the void for lack of a better term. Okay. And then like, once you like experience it, like then you'll get it right. It's, it's kind of, yeah. Okay. So we're going to do Shunya meditation. All right. So I want you guys to sit up straight. This is not in the guide. So there's some stuff, but Shunya is not in the guide. I don't think, anyway, maybe a little bit. Okay, you can take he headphones off, it's fine. All right, so what I want y'all to do is sit up straight. Okay, close your eyes. And the first thing that I want you to do is just notice whatever your senses are picking up outside of you. So even if you want to, you can open your eyes briefly but I want you to notice that, for example, you're able to hear sounds, right? So like listen to the sound of my voice or even with your eyes closed, like reach out in front of you and like maybe touch the desk, you know, touch something and just notice that like this object exists without outside of you, right? So just feel it and kind of notice that this thing is out here, but I am the one that is experiencing whatever the sensory input is. So I am the one who's doing the touching and the object is the thing that gets touched. Right? I am the listener and there are sounds outside. So there's the outside world which is sending sensory input into you. So take a moment to touch an object around you. Listen to the sound of my voice. Maybe notice a smell. And that fundamentally there are things outside you and your sensory organs are the entry point of things outside you to within you. I know it sounds kind of basic, but like recognize that that which you touch is not part of you, right? You just, you just have contact with it. The words that you hear are not part of you. They, you simply have contact with them. And now what we're going to do is focus on the sensory apparatus. So notice that you have ears that are capable of hearing, right? So we're not going to focus on the sound itself or my words, but just the fact that you're able to hear. So where do you do the hearing? What is your experience of hearing? If you're using the sense of touch, as you touch, notice that the sensations that you feel are not the table, 
You don't actually feel the table. What you feel is you touching the table. That there are tactile sensors within your fingers that will fear, feel pressure and warmth or cold or temperature. And that that's not actually the object, it is your perception of the object. And so what I want you to do is push lightly against an object near you. And feel the sensation across your fingers. Rub an object around you, and once again, feel the sensation across your fingers. And now what I want you to do is go even one layer deeper. And notice that even without touching something, so relax your hands, maybe fold them in your lap, adopt a mudra if you prefer, and notice that your fingers and hands generate signals without any external contact. So now we've left the external world completely behind. And notice that your hands have a proprioceptive sense, which means you can tell where they are in space. You can feel where your hands are, whether they're above your head, in your lap, you know where your body is. And even without any kind of external contact, your body generates signals that tell you where you are. You can know where your hands are. You can know where your fingers are because they're sending you signals. They're letting you know, hey, I'm here. Hey, I'm here. Hey, I'm here. And now I want you to travel up your arms. So start with your hands, then focus on your forearms and notice that your forearms exist. And then move up to your elbows. And now notice all the signals that your body is sending you. And then up to your arms. And you may even feel uncomfortable, like moving. If you want to, you can go ahead and move. And now up to your shoulders. And now into the chest or upper abdomen. And this is where the practice becomes difficult. So if you, if you are a veteran meditator, this may be accessible to you. If not, you can just practice for this next part. And so notice that the sensations in your body, that there's a black box kind of in the middle of your body, that you may feel hunger or fullness in your stomach, and you may experience like some sensation in the upper chest, around your lungs, but actually in the core of your being, notice that there's like a complete absence of sensation. That, that there is something that sends you no signals whatsoever. It's just an, the only way you can notice it's there is because if you follow the sensations of the body, they stop at some point. And in the core of your being, there is a hollowness. And now focus on that point. Focus on that sensation. Now ask yourself, what is that? Notice that your body and your mind signal to you that they exist, either through the presence of thoughts or physical sensations. But how is it that you can feel nothing 
at the core of your being. And meditate upon that thing. practice for another minute or so. And now externalize your attention again. Start to come out of that place. Return to your body. Go up the chest to the shoulders, arms, elbows, forearms, fingers. Listen to the sound of my voice. And notice that the world begins to exist again. Go ahead and come on back. All right, so I'm going to ask you all a couple of questions if you really want to understand Shunya. So first question is, who was able to feel Shunya? Okay, so it's okay for not everyone to feel it. So now let me ask y'all a question. For those of you that were able to feel shunya, there was shunya within, right? So tell me what is outside of you? Where else can shunya be? Right? So if you understand what Shunya feels like, you will notice that it is everywhere. So like, now you're starting to get it. Because what the yogis essentially discovered, so when they say that reality is false, and they call reality maya or illusion... That is fundamentally, that can be discovered. If you want to understand why reality is an illusion or this concept of maya, do this shunya practice. Because then you'll begin to see, oh shit, none of this crap is real. Right? Because it's shunya. It's void. It's null. And then what happens, once you have that realization, everything that bothers you in the world ceases to bother you. It's transformative. And then suddenly, like, these things that used to restrict you, like, oh, like, I want to be the best. Like, the best is not a real thing. Silly. Right? And so this is how you become free of ahamkar. Right? It's like, it's freeing. So this is why... People call samadhi or moksha freedom, enlightenment. It's understanding. And with with the understanding comes the freedom and the bliss. So this is the other weird thing is that we think about in logic, happiness, knowledge, and freedom are like three dimensions, right? Those are not the same thing. Like freedom and happiness are not part of the same scale. 
Like, they're like three qualitatively different things. But moksha is the place where all three of these things meet. And if you want to understand that, you do this shunya practice. For those of you, I understand it's hard. It's like an advanced practice. But if you like understood that shunya is on the outside, you'll begin, be, begin to see like, oh crap, if it's scary, then you're doing it right. Because what that means is like true freedom and like happiness are like there. You just have to pick them up. But you're not ready to. And so then the question becomes, why aren't you ready to pick it up? What is it that holds you back? If you are scared of embracing shunya, what is it that is frightened? Very good, right? So some people get it, the ego. Right? So what wants to control? The ego wants to control. Shunya doesn't need to control. The ego. So for those of you that are able to follow along, now you understand how the Shunya practice will dissolve your ego. Because in order to embrace it, you have to let go of that which holds on. And then you get to detachment. You guys get that? Like that's like people ask, how do you detach? And this is how you detach. But unless you understood the meditation... You're not going to understand. I could tell you guys time and time again, here's how you detach, here's how you detach. Here's how. You won't understand it. Like, you're not going to get it. For those of you that get it, now you understand what the, the nature of attachment is. If you want to understand what attachment is, it is that which is terrified of shunya. Does that make sense? No, we're going to do maybe one more question. Is it possible to be too detached? Yes and no. The only thing that is concerned about being too detached is the ego. <laughs> so it's worried about being too detached. But so what? Too detached means that you're measuring it against something. Do you guys get that? Like, what does it mean to be too detached? That means that there's an appropriate level of attachment. Who determines the appropriate level of attachment? The ego does. Because it's like, I want to be this detached. You guys get that? Because here's what's happening in the ego. The ego is like, I want to be detached enough to where I can be successful in life and get the things that I want to, but I don't suffer. So there's a beautiful, there's a perfect level of detachment. That's how spiritual I want to be. I want to be spiritual so I can have all of my desires satisfied and be like materialistic. I want to use spiritual growth as a means to a materialistic end. That's what the ego does. Right? I want to meditate so I can get promoted at work. I want to meditate so I experience less anxiety. I want to meditate so that I don't have social anxiety so I can meet someone and get laid. It's all hijacking spirituality for its own materialistic ends. This is why the world is filled with false spirituality now. And the more that people have recognized the value of meditation, the worse this problem has become. The ego isn't cancer. It's just that which shackles us. Right? And so, like, here's the big thing. Are you okay being shackled? So, so how do we hold the shun? Okay, so there's different questions here, all right? So one is, like, some of these are questions from people who I think, like, have understood it, and some is, like, from people who haven't quite understood which is okay. I'm not trying to say that one is better than the other. It just may not be the meditation technique for you, right? It's like, not everyone is a mage. It's like, here's a mage staff, and if people are into, be like, being a mage, they're like, oh, this is great. For fighters, they're, like, trying to melee people with their mage staff, and they're like, I, I don't understand this, which is totally fine. No judgment, right? So one is, how do we hold the shunya? That's a good question. You practice. Holding the shunya is absolutely the goal. So this person has understood it. But why is spiritual growth even worth it? You haven't even addressed that yet? Yeah. Worth it means what? Worth it to whom? Worth it for what end? Worth implies like worth it for what? And so the answer is spiritual growth is not worth it. Because spiritual growth is not interested in the it. The, the whole goal of spiritual growth is to abandon the it. Right? To exist without a goal. So that, that's like, I haven't addressed that because I can't. It's not worth it, by definition. 
It is the, what spirituality is, is letting go of things being worth it. Okay, so now this person is asking, doesn't the ego stop us from getting into situations that will kill us? Absolutely. So now we're going to take a page from science, okay? So ego is a universal experience of all human beings, right? So why is that? It's because the ego has been selected for by evolution. Ego is what helps us survive. So it's absolutely evolutionary. Like, so if we think about, you know, becoming successful in life, you want your ego. Like the truly enlightened baby will never become, quote, well, they'll still become successful. That's another paradox we'll, we'll get to in another, another day. But it is the chase for success that the ego wants, right? And so like, there's a reason why it evolved. It evolved because it helps us survive. It has survival utility, but it doesn't have happiness utility. So ego helps us survive, but doesn't make us happy because we've evolved to not be happy. We've evolved to survive. And this is the core, this is the core problem with being a human being in the world today is that this body and this brain and this mind are not designed for happiness. They're designed for survival. And everyone is looking for happiness using an instrument that was designed for something else. That's why it's hard. That's why spirituality is something that you have to work towards. Right? Because it's not like, it's like, you know, we're, we're living out of the back of our car. It's not what it was designed for. The car was designed for movement. And here we are trying to use it for something else. So this is the fundamental problem of being human is that everything within you is designed for survival. It's not designed for contentment or happiness. So now you have to decide, like, and everyone's going to have to make their own journey and their own decision. Like, what do you want to chase? Do you want to chase the ego? Or do you want to go ahead and let it go? Do you want to embrace shunya or do you want to be successful? And it's a decision that every person has to make. So this is the problem that Buddha had as he chased. So this is Buddha's conclusion is that you can chase success as much as you want to, but it's never going to get you anywhere because he rose to the top, right? He was like a king and powerful and respected and lucky and wealthy. And he was like, I'm still unhappy. And so he decided to choose happiness. Not everyone has to choose happiness. Some people choose power. Totally fine. It's your choice. You decide. What is the purpose of the ego? The ego, the ego is a huge survival benefit. Right? It's like very, very helpful that way. Why not both? <laughs> uh, yeah, you can do, you can try to do both. Can you choose both? Sure. There's not the, the real answer is that, that it's not really a choice. It's like, even that is like, it's hard to describe, but like it's shunya, right? It's all nothing. So there's no both. There's neither. Right? So these are all constructions. All of these questions are coming from the construction of an egotistical mind. Right? So like, I'm totally fine. Like, so here's the problem. We're going to get back to regular stuff. So I told you all we're going to go off the rails today. So this is the thing. So like, this is the challenge we have at, at, at Healthy Gamer and HG is like, do we go down this road for the people who have been here for a while, right? Or do we do the same old crap? So we got to like throw a bone to the people who, are, who have been here for a while and meditate on a regular basis and stuff like that. Even if we lose uh, some of y'all along the way, which I apologize, like it, you know, I can't, if I'm teaching to 3000 people, I can't have one thing that's effective for everyone. Right? So this is some, some cult level stuff. So what I would love to do is like, these are the kinds of things that ideally are not taught on stream, but like if we ever do like a retreat, right? Some real cult stuff, like we'll have like, ideally we'd have a retreat for people who are long-term community members and re meditate on a regular basis so we can do advanced topics. So the key point here is that, the, you know, if you've done the Shunya meditation, you understood it, then keep, continue doing it. And then you will find the answers to all these questions. And then if you didn't get it and you're like, what the hell is going on? That's totally fine. Please accept my apologies and we'll get on to other things. It's not like some people, so be careful about the ego now. So some of you may be thinking, oh, I'm one of the ones who got it. Oh, I'm going to go to Dr. K's special retreat and be inducted into the cult. 
Wonderful. That's ego too, right? There's no better or worse. It's just different levels. Let's say just like different people, right? It's already failed. Absolutely. That's why I'm pointing it out. You guys get that? It's like, you see how sneaky the ego is? Now that we're active and you're not meditating, the ego will find its way in. Some of y'all are going to be feeling bad and some of y'all are going to be feeling Chad, right? But it's all ego. It's just what you are. You moved away from Shunya if you're feeling Chad, and you moved away from Shunya if you're feeling bad. Have I managed to balance the ego and spirituality? <laughs> Oh, that's such a good question. Uh, um, let me think about how I would describe my experience. Here's the way that I experience ego. So I have a garden and I try to grow things in it. And periodically, like some animals and stuff like rabbits and stuff will come and eat all of my effort. That rabbit is my ego. Occasionally, I'll try to get things done, and then the ego shows up and, like, torpedoes everything that I'm trying to do. But then, like, much like the rabbit, it, you know, it's just trying to live, too. So I can sigh and I can be like, well, that sucks. But at least the, at least the rabbit got to eat these awesome carrots and sweet potatoes. Right? It's okay. I have an ego. It gets the better of me many times, which it's going to do because I've decided that I'm not going to, you know, be a monk. So it's like, that's the price that I pay. So it's okay. It belongs. It, it deserves to be there. All right. I see this chat, Amanzur. I see you, the all-seeing eye of Sauron. <laughs> so how do you know if it's the voice of ego or it's the voice the good voice in your head with practice you begin to see what the rabbit looks like and then you can understand oh did i do this or is this the rabbit so remember that the the so the the real goal is not to get rid of your ego it's to be in control of your ego so your, your ego should be like, listen to you instead of the other way around. 